All right, how you doing everybody? Good. So today, we get to plant for pollinators. So right now, we're in uh, July, everything's in bloom. Just, it's glorious. Uh, we're starting to go into our monsoon season, which tends to bring up even more things. Um, our late summer bloomers are coming in. So we're seeing a lot of, uh, of pollinators. Sometimes you'll be going down the, down the road and you'll notice, uh, you know, some people have that, that little butterfly garden or, or just things in their yard that really attract butterflies, bees, hummingbirds, <laughs> and you're wanting to do something like that in your own yard. So we're gonna talk today mostly about um, what plants are, are best for uh, attracting pollinators and also um, how best to uh, prepare the yard for them and, and care for them. They're actually uh, pretty easy. The nice thing about the pollination plants, they tend to be in that range that uh, are low water users, take heat really well. Um, they just have a tendency to fall into that category for some reason. So if you're looking for something that's low care, this is definitely the type of, of uh, garden to go with. Um, so we'll, we'll go into, uh, uh, say for example, if we want to go with butterflies, the main thing with butterflies, they like to have flowers that they can land on. They're, they don't like to hover while they're drinking. Um, there's a, a moth that you sometimes see that will hover while it's drinking. It's actually a daytime moth, it's not a butterfly. Ho ho uh, hovers like a hummingbird, but most of the butterflies aren't going to do that. So you do want something they can land on. So the, you have plenty of varieties that uh, uh, will work well for them. The daisies tend to do very well. This is an echinacea. We've got a couple of them here. These are our echinacea right here. Uh, also called coneflower. Come in a lot of different colors. And it's very easy for the butterflies to land on them and just relax and sip as much as they like. I've got Rebecca here, another daisy type. This one is only just barely starting to bloom. This is going to have great big yellow daisies on it. Um, also called Black Eyed Susan. It's got a few other names as well, depending on the variety. So these are uh, a couple of examples. Over here I've got Butterfly Bush at the main. Big, big clusters of uh, flowers. You see these big, I've actually got a, a bee hovering around if you can see it. <laughs> Definitely a great one for pollinators. I basically went through the garden center yesterday and just grabbed everything that had pollinators hovering around it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you can see we got quite a collection going and the butterflies and bees were just having a heyday yesterday so it was easy to find plenty of things that they like. This is called butterfly bush. You'll get lots of bees and butterflies on this one. They love it. Um, they come in different sizes and colors. Generally shades of pink or purple or sometimes white. Um, in rare cases, you can find a yellow. They come in every size from about a foot and a half to about 12 feet tall and everywhere in between. So whatever it is you're needing in your yard, you can fit one of these and they're going to love it. Put it in full blasting sun, it can take it. And if you forget to water once in a while, it'll take that too, it really doesn't care. These are really wonderful for that. So are these, uh, these flowers. <coughs> a lot of these really are wildflowers. And so they do so well. If you're looking for that low care garden, you're going to love these. Um, here's, uh, this one right here is Gallardia. Again, great low, uh, low water flower. You'll find this just growing wild. The Rubecchia and Echinacea, you'll find them growing wild. Sometimes they'll even recede. If they find a place they like, They'll actually drop seeds and spread and start filling up the yard. So give them a little space if you can. And they'll actually uh, multiply and uh, give you even more. If you have a, a wildflower garden going, these are great flowers for that. So uh, if you're, um, whether you're starting from a plant or from seed, uh, wildflower gardens are a great way to go if you're attracting pollinators. This one right here is Mexican hat. It's another wildflower. And uh, this one is a, a great one for butterflies and bees. Over here, this one, the butterflies were hovering around this one quite a bit yesterday. Uh, this is a uh, autumn sage. Comes in various shades of pink and red and also white. 
This one is a major favorite of hummingbirds as well. If, you, if any of you have this one, you know that you've got hummingbirds around all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> People thought, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Oh, and this is another one that you hardly ever water. It's just wonderful. This, like with a lot of them, you just cut it back once a year. You don't try to hedge it. Um, this one will get very full, almost like a very small bush. Um, but it doesn't really take to hedging well, and it just won't manicure. If you try to cut it, it grows right back. I, it grows so fast, and it just goes right back into bloom. This is another one that I've also been recommending for everyone for deer resistance. Lately, uh, we've been in severe drought, even for us, and it's making all the animals pretty thirsty and hungry, and they're eating things that they don't like. They're that desperate. This is something that they really don't like. They don't want to eat it. And if they do manage to get desperate enough to eat it, because <laughs> they might at this point, if they do, it'll grow right back. That's a great thing about this. It'll, it'll just grow right back within a couple of weeks. You won't be able to tell that they ever touched it. Hmm. It's amazing. I've actually cut these things back. I mean, really whacked it just all the way down. And within two weeks, it was back to its full height and in full bloom. Couldn't tell I had done anything to it. How long does it bloom? How long does it bloom? It starts about May and just keeps going till frost. This is a great one right here. Yes. Are these all sun, full sun? Most of these are definitely full sun. There are things that will work well in the shade as well. Um, mostly, you're, you're going to find a lot of stuff in the sun. But I would recommend putting in it at least a few shade things, simply because uh, you'll notice the pollinators, especially the bees, they like to be out in the cool of the morning, and then they come out again a little bit in the evening, but they take a break uh, during the heat of the day, just like the rest of us. Um, they tend to stay out of the sun, but if you have a shade area with some shade plants in there, then they have a place that they can pollinate uh, during the day when it's hot. So you can keep the pollinators around uh, in, by keeping them in the shade during the daytime. I didn't have a whole lot down there that I could bring up. Um, there were quite a few things that I, I left down there, but because uh, so many people were shopping through them and I didn't want to grab them. But there's actually a lot that you can play with. We've got hydrangea down there. We've got some gorgeous canna lilies down there. Those are the ones with the orange and red blooms and great big leaves. Look tropical. They're actually hardy. Um, they will make it through the winter. They'll die back to the ground, just cut away the dead stuff at the end of winter and throw it away, and it'll uh, come back up and, and bloom again in, in July. So you have plenty of, of options down there. Oh, did, did you raise your hand? No. Okay, yes. Um, would you please mention for us people who are not gardeners, I'm just learning <laughs> sure. if they're like perennials, annuals, deciduous, evergreen, because Absolutely. we're trying to stick with kind of evergreen stuff that flowers, so. Great. And I know some people, they don't care if they die back, but we don't like this stick, so. And <laughs> yes. since I'm just learning, it's helpful for me. That's to... a great question. She wants to know which ones are evergreen. Um, a lot of these will die back in the winter, but there are evergreen ones. Um, let's see. Did I use um, we've got some rosemary right behind us. It's not in bloom at the moment, that's why I didn't bring it up. Rosemary is a great one, blooms in spring and fall. Covered in pretty blue flowers, and the pollinators love it. Um, all of the herbs actually make wonderful um, uh, plants for pollinators. They generally bloom about July. They don't have the longest blooming season, but if you're thinking about putting herbs in the garden anyway, they're great to have around. You should smell it's these. <laughs> and uh, let's see, this one is just barely starting to bloom. It'll be covered in little pink flowers pretty soon, and the pollinators will be all over it. This one is about to start. I've got some basil here. You can see it's actually been blooming for a while now. Um, and these are just in small pots. When they really start growing, you're just going to have this mass of little pink flowers. And the pollinators love these. And they do actually a wonderful job. Of course, when you're uh, planted for pollinators, um, and I will get more into the evergreens in a little bit. Uh, when you're planting for pollinators, you don't really want to use a lot of pesticides. Obviously, and you don't want to hurt your pollinators, right? And they are insects. They are susceptible to insecticides. 
So anything you can do to keep the bad bugs out, the herbs tend to repel bad bugs, but the good bugs don't mind them. So this is a great way to help your pollinators out and make their environment more safe. So using herbs are a wonderful way to go. So if you're looking for something more evergreen, rosemary is a wonderful thing. Um, there's a few different types. There's a, a ground cover type in a pot, it'll trail over the side uh, or over a retaining wall. Uh, there's uh, bushy types, they come in various sizes. Uh, there's also sages, which are, uh, they, they don't make it through our harshest winters, but they'll make it through some of our winters. Uh, so you'll usually get a few years out of them and they tend to stay green or mostly green through the, the winter. Uh, let's see, what else have we got out there? Uh, the hawthorns are a good one. Uh, that is that evergreen bush. You see it a lot around the area because it does so well here. Uh, they put on pink flowers in the spring. Some varieties will put it on a little bit during the, um, the fall as well. Very, very pretty. Uh, so you do have uh, quite a few options. Like I said, I kind of went through and I think I wound up with a lot of, a lot of stuff that was in the shade because it was hot yesterday, remember? It was before, before it rained and it was very hot. So everything was kind of fluttering around this stuff and not so much around the shrubs out there. Yeah. Do these plants more or less, can you plant them in like really bad soil or rocky soil or do, they, do they have to have like special... Can you plant them in or? bad soil? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, try to amend your soil as much as you can. Mm -hmm. We have the worst soil possible. Yeah. These plants are super tough. They really, truly are. You can't do better than these. Yeah, because I've got like all rock in the yard. It's horrid. <laughs> yes. You know, all the gravel. So I got to get, you know, dig that aside yes. first before I can even get to the ground. And it's so just So basically, um, we have poor soil to begin with. That's just the area we live in. We okay. have poor soil. The natives have to be tough to make it here. And as mm -hmm. I said, some of these are actually wildflowers that grow in the area. Okay. So that's how tough they are. Okay. They actually grow here. Um, what's in your yard is actually even worse. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be straight <laughs> with you. Your contractor, when he built your house, he came in with excavation equipment. And we've got a hummingbird right yeah. here. <laughs> he came in with the excavation equipment. Mm -hmm. Cleared all the good soil, or the best soil, I should say, that you had. I mean, that topsoil, it wasn't the greatest, but yeah. it's, it's better than what's underneath. Mm -hmm. The topsoil is the, the part, the layer of soil um, on top of the ground is softer than what's underneath. It's something that's more growable. Uh, it's got living microbes in there, which are important to plant health. It's got decaying plant matter. Uh, it's, it's got organics in there so that things can live in it. Um, he came in and he scraped all of that away and sold it to someone as garden soil or some odd thing and got a premium price for it too. And then when he was done building the house he brought and filled dirt which is leftover stuff from excavations that it is horrible. You don't really want that for your yard but that's what you got. Um, it's incredibly rocky. It is the densest, hardest mm -hmm. clay junk. I mean, if any of you have ever had me out, mm -hmm. or if you've ever tried to plant in your own yard, some of you have actually tried. I know we've got some hardcore gardeners in here. You have actually tried to do that without jackhammering. Mm -hmm. And you learned real, real quick to hire someone to do that, right? I've got a lot of no heads nodding right now. We really do go out, I'm actually the, the head planter, we actually go out with jackhammers and digging bars and all kinds of equipment in order to get through that filter that they gave you. It's horrible stuff. We bought a pickaxe when yeah. we moved here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. a pickaxe yeah. is like the cheap way to go, yeah. but yeah. if you're not used to using it every day, it will wear yeah. you yeah. out. <laughs> well, it helps immensely. Yeah. yeah, so basically... Shovels don't work. You no. have, I mean, like I said, this isn't... A, a place that has really rich dirt to begin with, but you don't even have what the natives get to grow in. The yeah. stuff you have is even worse. Yeah. That stuff that he left you, it's, it's pretty awful. So even when you're planting really tough plants, um, you really, really want to amend your soil. So use the, the premium mulch. This is specifically made for amending our northern Arizona soils. Um, uh, make sure to use 
make sure to use that. That is your number one thing. Use. I really do recommend using um, a few products to help out, like the root and grow, the humic acid. They're really going to help try to return that soil to something resembling the topsoil that the property had before you built on it. Yes? Uh, uh, I recommend soaking your area mm -hmm. overnight. Yes. With tons of water and the next day you'll be able to do it. Yeah, That's what I depending on um, the type of, of soil you have, a lot of people do that. They'll go ahead and just soak it. If it's really rocky, it'll still be tough. You'll still be using your pickaxe and other equipment, but it does make a difference. It really does. Some people have told me I, that they had to soak it overnight a few nights in a row in order to get the water all the way down to get that soil softened up a bit. So remember, you're going to be planting in that, and even the toughest plants are going to be saying, what? is this. <laughs> so really, you want to, to amend your soil. Dig your hole wider than the root ball, about two to three times wider. Kind of loosen that up. Take that and mix it with the mulch here. And I would also mix in some fertilizer. This is the fertilizer that uh, we make. We have tough dirt here. Like I said, even our topsoil isn't that great. And what you have is worse. We made this for here, knowing how deficient our soil is and how unusual our soil is. If you compare it to the rest of the country, it's very, very unusual actually. So you do want to fertilize. This is an acidic fertilizer. Our soil here is so alkaline, it's almost sterile. It takes some pretty tough plants to grow in it. And some plants are native, but will pick certain spots to grow in because they've got to find those better spots. That's how they survive. So the seeds spread out all over, but only some of those seeds actually make it and keep growing as plants because they've got to find just the right spot. So use the, use the mulch, use that fertilizer, really uh, help your soil along. Try to make the soil more natural, um, a, a little more like a, like a real topsoil. Try to make it more natural because it really isn't in a natural state right now the way you've got it. So. <clears throat> um, you want to prep, prep your ground real good. Dig your hole. Uh, don't, please don't make this mistake. <laughs> dig your hole only as deep as the root ball, and have it level. Uh, level. You, you're actually better off having it a little high than having it too low. So don't, don't put it down low in a well. You'll find that when monsoon kicks in, everything planted low is just going to die. Hmm. That's just how it is. As soon as you get a good rain, it's gone. This right here, this is Mexican hat. No, why? Oh, why is that? Um, it funnels in a lot of moisture. It'll also funnel in a lot of soil. Um, when the monsoon comes in, you're basically getting a whole year's worth of rain all at once. So that's a lot of water to be funneling in. I mean, they're already kind of uh, in danger of being overwatered. They're just right at the brink during monsoon because they get inundated. So funneling in all that water can just make it worse. But what'll also happen is it'll wash dirt and debris into the hole. And then you have dirt sitting against the stems and the trunks of the plant <coughs> or the tree, and it'll cause it to rot. Mm. The skin or the bark will actually rot off and the whole thing will die. It's like cutting an artery. When the bark comes off, that's it. The plant dies. So that's very important not to plant deep and you will find that out. Uh, when monsoon hits, anything that got planted too deep, you'll know it, it very soon. Yes. But when you're saying make it level, mm -hmm. but you don't mount dirt around it after that, it's just truly level like it. You can mulch it afterward if you like, but be careful not to put the mulch against the trunk or the stem. But you can kind of build it up. I, some people like to put on mulch, which is a good idea. It helps with, um, especially during the drier months, It'll help kind of slow down the evaporation. Um, you might have gravel already. You might be using bark. There's different types of top dressing you can use. Just don't have it right against the trunk. But so don't mount the dirt. like. Um, yeah, don't mount the dirt over it. That doesn't really help. It needs to actually be something different if you're going to do that. Um, something with a different texture than what's already there for it to actually work. But don't, don't bury it. This, the top of this root ball, the top of this root ball, that's the, where the top is supposed to be. 
so you don't want to plant it deep. The only thing you can get away with on that is tomatoes. You can plant those deep. That's I the only thing. With them. Yeah. <laughs> so pick out your plants. We've got a lot of different plants here. If you want evergreen, um, I have to say with the evergreens, uh, they have a tendency to be short-term bloomers. You know, they'll they'll bloom in the spring and then they're done. So right now, not a lot of them are blooming. Some of them will bloom in the fall. So not a whole lot. Uh, you know, if you go out there, you'll see there's a lot of evergreen bushes, but they're not all in bloom. Um, so you, you tend to end up with a shorter blooming time. So to get the color, you have to go. Yeah, if you really want a, a huge amount of color all the way through summer, um, plug in more of these. What I would recommend for you if you're doing evergreen, and a lot of you, I actually do recommend that you have evergreens in your in your yard. What that does is uh, it makes sure that when everything goes dormant uh, in the in the yard in the winter, you still have something to look at. The, the, the landscape still has some kind of structure. We recommend 30%. If you make your yard about 30% evergreen, then it'll still look like something when everything else is dormant. It, it'll still have a, a structure to it and still look like a real landscape. And then when everything else starts growing in the spring and the summer, it'll just be an even fuller landscape. But it'll still look like landscape in, in winter. So I, I always do recommend about 30% evergreen. Cotoni Esther is another one, isn't it? Cotoni Esther is a great one. Yeah, I mean, it, yes. it looks good. You get some different color with the, uh, with the red. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, we, we made the mistake there. Beautiful one, but we had a tree that was yes. going into that, and we tried. Tried, yes. Yeah. So I get that a lot. Um, she, she mentioned that uh, Cotoniaster really is a great one for pollinators. They love it. You'll see in the spring, they get tiny white flowers all over it, and the pollinators are just going crazy. They love Cotoniaster. Right now, it's not in bloom. It is past its blooming point. Those little white flowers are in the process of turning into red berries. Mm -hmm. So pretty soon we're going to see a lot of color on the Cotoniaster. Very, very pretty. So it's definitely worthwhile having. There's ground cover types. There's bush types. There's a great big bush type. They're wonderful. It's evergreen and it's super tough. So again, if you're looking for low maintenance, it's a great one to have. I do definitely recommend it. Um, you look know, at pollinators in spring and color in the fall. So it's a wonderful one to have. She also mentioned she tried to transplant it and found out our climate is terrible for transplanting. Sorry guys, you're better off just buying a new one. You're making more work for yourself by digging something twice. So, uh, but yeah, absolutely. Cotoniaster is another great one. Again, just don't have it up here because it's not in bloom at the moment. But it's a great spring bloomer as a lot of the evergreens are. And they have a smaller root system too. That's another reason, right? That they don't, uh, that they don't transplant as well? Well, the fact that they grow big means they're going to have a big root yeah. system. Yeah. Well, ours, or, yeah. well, maybe that was, ours look beautiful until we, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cotoniasters, they grow big. The ground covers get really wide, or the bushes get really big. And so, yeah, they have good root systems. Of course, you have to have a good root system to survive in this mm -hmm. climate. Yeah. It's just necessary. So, yeah, that's going to make it tough to transplant. So um, you can do um, both annuals and perennials. Everyone's different. Some people prefer to just stick with annuals. Make it, uh, you know, they, that means you plant every year. Annuals don't survive the winter or they, they don't survive the whole year round. And uh, they tend to be big, uh, really great at blooming. I mean, they're just covered in color all the time. That's the wonderful thing about annuals. They just, they're really, really showy. And they always look so fresh and so pretty because you're planting them every year. So they just look fabulous. And you don't have to worry about uh, long term as much. Uh, how am I going to get this through the winter? Is it cold hardy enough? Am I, uh, do I need to have someone here in the winter to water for me because I'm out of town? Do I do this? Do I do that? So a lot of people, they just prefer to keep it simple. Go with annuals. They get along with plants that grow in a certain season and they stick with that. So if you're that kind and you want to do annuals, there's a whole greenhouse here for you to choose from. Plenty, <laughs> trust me. This is zinnias. The one I was just holding, this is lantana. Most lantanas are annual. You see them growing in Phoenix, the perennial down there, because they don't have winter down there. We have oh. winter, they don't like winter. <laughs> there oh, is no. one, there is one called Miss Huff 
Hardy Lantana. Miss Huff is good down to about, I think, 10, 15 degrees. So if you find it kind of a warmer spot in your yard during the winter, you can actually get it through the winter, but it's the only one that has a chance here. This one is a Zinnia, another great one for pollinators, again, annual. Um, this one's uh, pretty good about reseeding. Uh, so sometimes, if the conditions are right, again, if you, if you have gravel and weed cloth, it's not going to happen. But if you have a more natural landscape, you just might get some of these to come back up. So these are, are great. Um, I think all the ones on this end right here, these are all perennial. Uh, we've got meadow sage. Uh, oh, the bees love the sages. Uh, we've got the echinacea. This is Pinston in here. Hummingbirds and bumblebees like this one. They do great on this. Uh, the bumblebees, you know, they're so big and fat, they kind of like a nice big flower to support them. So they, they do well in the Pinstamen. Um, this one uh, came recommended to me by uh, one of our employees. She actually has written the, the books on local Prescott wildflower hikes. Mm. And so uh, she, she was here yesterday. I'm not sure she's here today. Sure. Her name's Susan. So if you happen to catch her, she's a great one to talk to for wildflowers. What's the name on that one? Pinstamen. This is a wildflower. Um, in fact, recently you saw tall stalks of, of uh, light pink flowers growing along roadsides. Do you remember that? Um, those are the pinstamen, just growing wild. So that shows you how, how tough the pinstamen are. They typically, again, come in shades of pink or maybe purple. So let's see what over here. Again, I've got some more animals. These are the pintas. What are those? Pintas. Penta. <laughs> Again, take heat and drought like champs. They are annual plantain every year. Here I've got uh, another favorite of pollinators. These two right here. This is goldenrod. This will get much taller than it already is. These typically get around three feet, I think it is. And then this is yarrow. This particular kind is called moonshine yarrow. Pollinators love these, both bees and butterflies. Uh, just all over them. You'll see that these really attract. Um, you'll find yarrow actually growing wild around here. We have a, it's a white one. And it's a shorter variety, and you'll see it just growing wild in the woods. So this is another great wildflower for us. They both do well here. What about uh, it does, Are they the true? <laughs> are they the true? Uh, this right here is goldenrod. Golden. Yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah, if you if you happen to know your allergic yeah. to goldenrod, I wouldn't use it. Uh, obviously, flowers that are good for pollinating are going to have pollen. So if yeah. you have hay fever or, or uh, pollen allergies, you're going to have to be a little bit careful. Yeah. You might want to go with uh, uh, more like the maybe the autumn sage or the pinstamen. Uh, you know, some of those tend to be a little yeah, easier. Yeah, isn't that either? Yeah, but it, goldenrod. Yeah. Now, of course, we cannot, we cannot talk about pollinators without talking about monarchs. Monarchs are the big deal of the day right now. Everyone's become more aware of monarchs and their migration cycles and, and what they have to do to keep their, their life cycles going and, and that their uh, natural habitats are disappearing. So what a lot of people are wanting to do is plant specifically for monarchs. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you want two things. One, you need something for the adults to feed on, and you need something for them to lay their eggs on so that the caterpillars can feed. So if you've got those two things, you've got a beautiful, perfect monarch garden. So for the adults, you want the pollinator your flowers, especially the butterfly favorite. So make sure you get your echinacea, get your galardia, um, butterfly bush and your yarrow and butterflies love these and then this right here is milkweed so milkweed there's a few uh, a lot of different varieties of milkweed basically the caterpillars feed almost exclusively on milkweed there's a few other things that they will be willing to eat they'll eat fennel uh, that's another good one if you want uh, to put that in your in your garden it's another herb um, but mostly they want milkweed, and really the, 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 the adults are going to look specifically for milkweed to lay their eggs on. So if you want monarchs, you got to have it. It's just, it's a necessity. You can't uh, do without. you got to have the milkweed. It does come in colors like yellow, orange, pink, white. Uh, 
There is a, <clears throat> they're native to the southwest and midwest. midwest. Uh, there's a lot of different varieties that grow in that area. Here, the most common of the native milkweed is the uh, horsetail milkweed, uh, also called uh, world uh, milkweed. It's that weed that you take for granted because it grows everywhere. You, you didn't even realize it was milkweed, but it's all over the place. Um, but if you don't have some, especially if your yard is really <coughs> here, the weeds and things, you can plant some. You can plant some prettier varieties too. This is one of them. Uh, most of your milkweeds are annual. That means they may drop seed if they can, but they're not going to make it through the winter. They're just going to die, and hopefully seeds will survive them. There is one or two varieties of perennial types. If you prefer your perennial types, I myself am a, a perennial gardener. I like to put in plants that last all the way throughout the year and just keep coming back. Uh, so we do have, I think, one plant in stock, uh, one type of milkweed plant in stock that uh, is perennial. Um, to know which one it is, all you have to do is look at the tag, look at the hardiness. Right here. So this one says it's hardy down to zone 8. Zone 8 is Cordis Junction, so pretty warm. It's too cold here. You want to see a lowered number. We've got one down there that's hardy down to zone 4. We're zone 6, by the way. So, but yeah, that means it can take a lot of cold. So you, you want, if, you want, if you're a perennial gardener, that's the one you want to go with, and the plant will keep coming back from its roots every year. You can also plant milkweed from seed, and we carry a few varieties, uh, quite a few varieties of milkweed. And we even have uh, uh, people in the area that will be happy to share their seeds with you. They're pretty good about harvesting them and sharing them. So, <coughs> I have a question. Yes. How long, from seed, how long will it take to get that size? That size? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, milkweed's well, pretty now? fast. Yeah, milkweed's pretty fast, so depending on the variety you're looking at a year or two, you'll find that the annuals are faster growing than perennials. Right. So I would say for the perennials, somewhere in a year or two. Okay. Um, we have uh, an employee by the name of Patty Harley. <laughs> she grabs all the milkweed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just found last week when you got your, I, I finally got them in the ground last uh -huh. week because you were, she grabbed everything. Oh. That's what she grabbed <laughs> every year, right? Yes, Patty Harlan, so apparently she grabbed a lot of milkweed this yeah. year. Uh -huh. um, she has the largest monarch uh, garden in the area. And so she's always in need of more milkweed. <laughs> the, the monarchs just love her yard and so she can never have enough. Um, but like I said, they, they live almost exclusively on milkweed during their uh, larval stage. And then when they become adults and they feed on the flowers, they want nectar. So uh, you'll want to have a mix of both the milkweed they, they and They laugh at my garden and they actually say to me, it was only patties. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's probably what they did to me too. <laughs> yes. If you have any questions about milkweed or monarch butterflies, you have got to talk to Patty. Really, I mean, she'll tell you more than you ever thought you wanted to know. It's fascinating. It's just amazing. So, uh, let's see. What else have we got here to play with? You can actually incorporate these plants into your regular landscape. Some people will have a section set aside for pollinators, but if you want to just make your regular landscape a pollinator landscape, you can do that. We've got here. Uh, a couple, a few good varieties. Over here we have Chase Tree. I'm going to pull this up so you can see it better. Try not to trip over these wires. This is, this is actually a small tree. You, right now it looks like a bush and it's going to look like a bush for a while. But eventually this will actually grow into, into a multi trunked tree about 15 feet tall. Mm -hmm. So, What's that again? Chase? Chased, yes, Chased Tree. Some uh, monks named it. So, uh, this, uh, this will actually turn into a tree, so you can have a, a tree that blooms in the summer. The whole tree will be covered with flowers like this. Isn't this gorgeous? Mm -hmm. This is beautiful. How long does it bloom? Um, I think it starts about July and goes on for maybe uh, a month or so. It's just a beautiful, beautiful blooming tree. Uh, most of our trees, we have a lot of uh, flowering trees in this area. Most of them you notice flower in spring. There's only a couple that will flower during the summertime. This one is, is one of them. This is just 
gorgeous. Hold the, the, the flowers against the wind? Huh? Do the flowers hold up against the wind? Yeah, they did pretty good, actually. I've seen them, seen them in windy areas. This thing is tough. It can take freezing cold temperatures. It can take beating hot temperatures. I've actually seen this grow in Phoenix. They can take drought. They can just, they can take it. Um, just really great tree for this area. Can it live in a container? Can it live in a container? Yes. Uh, that's wonderful. Um, make sure the container is big enough. Any, any, any plant can live in a container. I do want to tell you, drought tolerant plants like to have lots of soil around their roots. They don't like being root bound. So make sure there's plenty of soil around them. So don't try to squeeze it into a really tight container. You can live in this one for a little while. But after a while, you definitely do want to go into a bigger container. Yes. Speaking of containers, how do you determine, because I have an issue with that, how do I know exactly, like if you wanted to plant that for its lifespan, like are you talking something five foot around or something? It or wouldn't have to be right small? away. I, I would just say, um, if you can tell. Uh, if it seems to be stressing out, drying out a lot, it's definitely needing a new container. And even a little bit bigger is going to help a lot, actually. Okay. So even if you only do a few inches at a time, that's okay. But like if you want to just plant something one time and have it... If you want to plant it one time, then yes, I'd go as large as you are willing to go with. And is there a way to determine that? Like if it's going to be 15 foot tall, you should have X amount of space or anything? Or are you wanting it to grow 15 foot <laughs> tall? Well, I'm just saying if you wanted it to go to its full potential. If you keep it trimmed, uh, keep it smaller, um, the root ball will kind of match it. Okay. Uh, if you don't let it get too close to its, its, um, its full grown size, um, because if it does that, then the roots are going to grow that big too. Right. It, it, they're right. just going to get root bound. So keeping it, keeping this part smaller, will keep the roots. It'll slow down the roots. It'll slow down the roots. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, it's just the way it, it works, and it so has to can, be more you can than just a little bit by of trimming it. Yes, you can okay. control it by trimming it. Okay. Does it have like seed pods, or I mean, is this a a, a nice? tree or is this a dirty tree? It does not have those big ugly seed pods that the desert willow has. Okay. <laughs> uh, another one here, you'll notice that this one it looks kind of similar. It, this is a bush. Again, if you want to actually landscape with things for the pollinators or things that are just flowering and pretty. Uh, this is another summer bloomer. It typically starts about, I want to say about June. It kind of varies uh, from year to year. I've seen it come earlier. And then it just keeps blooming through most of the summer. So this is another great one. This is called Caryopteris or Bluebeard. It's got a few different names. Blue Spirea, Bluebeard, Blue Mist. So if you see any of those names, that's, that's what it is. There's a few varieties of it. They grow to different sizes, but the flowers are pretty much the same. Do you have Wisteria here? Yes, we do have Wisteria. It is past its blooming point, so you won't see it up here. Um, I've got some honeysuckle here. I, I did bring up one vine. Um, so we do have wisteria over there, right there in the vine section. Okay. If you go over there, we've got wisteria, blooms in the spring, got a, a lot of other things too that flower. So if you're needing a vine, then you probably do, considering how they build the houses these days. <laughs> I do recommend vines to a lot of people. Um, they, it seems the style now when they build a new house, instead of putting in a fence, they put in a block wall. Boy, does that get hot. <laughs> She's like, yes, mm -hmm. it really gets hot. It doesn't look that pretty either, to be honest. Great for privacy. That seems to be everybody's top priority right now is privacy. Everyone wants privacy, so the contractors are putting in block walls, but they turn your backyard into a stone oven. You've got a stucco house, you've got a gravel lawn, and you've got a block wall surrounding you. You're literally in a stone oven. Very, very hot. So you put a vine on that wall or put trees or, or bushes against it to shade that wall, it will really cut down on the heat in your yard, make it a lot more livable. Is a honeysuckle a real good vine too? Because I know it, it was good in Tucson, I don't know. Honeysuckle is a great vine. Yeah. Honey, wisteria is too actually. Uh -huh. Wisteria, both of those are great vines to have. Um, they both require a trellis or something to climb right. up. If you want something to stick straight to the wall, I would say a trumpet vine would be better because it will actually stick to a block wall. Yeah. So it just depends on how you want. Some people prefer trellises. It allows them to control where the vine grows a little bit more. 
uh, and others want something that's just easy, it'll stick to the wall and climb up. So you have lots of uh, uh, varieties to pick from when it comes to vines. Uh, and the honeysuckle is a, another pollinator favorite, that's why I brought yeah, it up. Ours are covered and covered, and my tomatoes look great. We're yes. close to each other. We keep actually trimming it back in what, a couple days, huge, yes. yellow. Vines yellow. are very, very fast yeah. growers. And we're in viewpoint, and it, it's just the base of it, and it's like almost grafted, I don't know <laughs> what it was, you know what I mean, and it yeah. entwines, but it's thick, and we've had no yes. to keep it up. Honeysuckle um, is, you can grow it as a vine, you can also grow it as a bush. I find that actually more people grow it as a bush than as a vine. Um, they'll just kind of put it on the ground and, and kind of trim it from time to time and it'll just turn in, it'll mound up and turn into a bush. And very, very popular to grow it that way. So if you don't need a vine but you like the honeysuckle, some people love honeysuckle because of the fragrance. Um, and it is great for pollinators and like you said, if you are needing to attract pollinators for your tomatoes, Yes. So, yeah, great way to go. Yes. We also have a Virginia creeper up on the wall, mm -hmm. and it it grows like crazy. It's gorgeous. But it covers the wall yeah. great. And yeah, Virginia creeper. And yeah. Fall, it is really good. Uh, Virginia creeper is a great one, and that's one that's really good at climbing different types of surfaces as well. Um, one of the another reason why the honeysuckle is. Uh, uh, Popular. There's a variety called Halls. We carry several varieties, uh, different shades of pink, red, white, yellow, different kinds. But there's one that's yellow and white. It's called Halls. I believe it's this one. Nope, that, that's a purple leaf. Um, it looks a lot like that. I mean, they all look pretty similar. The nice thing about the Halls is that it is evergreen. So that's one to have on your list uh, because you, you don't have to look at a, a bare wall or a bare bush during the, the winter. And what color flowers are there? Yellow and white. Oh, okay. oh that's right. Yes, yellow and white. Halls. Like Halls cough drops? Yes, like Halls cough drops. Yes. Halls. 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 yes. Halls. 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 I'll see. I'll see. Any more questions? Yes. When you were talking about potting in the pot versus the ground, do you have to use a different potting soil versus the ground soil? Good question. Um, when you uh, pot a plant, whether it be a pollinator plant or any other kind, what soil are you supposed to use? You definitely want to use a potting soil. Please don't try to dig up dirt and put it in, the, in the pot. You will find that everything dies in it. It just, uh, dirt acts differently when it's in a container. You'll find that it just dries up to a chunk and, and you, it, it, it just turns to a rock. It will not work. Um, yeah, it, it will not work. You definitely want potting soil. This one right here, now I have to tell you, and I'm not speaking as an employee, okay? I'm not speaking as an employee. Before I came to work here, when I was still fairly uh, new to this business, I was looking everywhere for a good potting soil. I started, I'm the kind of person that always starts with the cheapest, you know? Never, never buy name brand when store brand will do. Um, I, I started off with the cheapest potting soils back, way back when I was, you know, still learning to garden and I was experimenting and, and looking for things that would work and I found the cheapest ones needed so much amendment I had to try to mix things into the I think they were just kind of leftover junk kind of thrown in sometimes there would be things in there I couldn't identify and some things I looked like things I did not want in my soil I mean ew you know so I I got away from the dollar a bag potting soils and I went and I tried different things and you know I tried different brands and I just wasn't happy with any of them and finally, this, this one was the last one I tried. Finally, I said, okay, I'm getting really tired of all these other brands. And I find that uh, sometimes I'll, I'll get a cheap brand and I don't like it. And then I'll start like, mixing other stuff into it to try to beef it up a little bit better. And uh, with the money I'm spending on the amendments, why bother? Just get a good, good quality. Finally, I tried this one. I tried Waters. This is the one I stuck with. Again, this is before I became an employee. There's no loyalty issues here. I don't have to be biased. This is the one I actually stuck with. And I was very, very happy with it. I'm still very happy with it. I really like this potting soil. So this is the one I recommend to everybody. And I would say you, you want a, a soil that has the right amount of drainage versus water retention. 
Um, that's extremely important. Um, you want it to be um, slightly acidic. In order, if all plants really want to be somewhere, if you're looking at the pH scale, seven is neutral. Most plants want to be in the sixes. The ones we call acid lovers, like the hydrangeas, the azaleas, they like to be in the fives. But most plants want to be in the sixes. Anything <coughs> over seven, there is no plant that really loves alkaline. Um, when the soil's too alkaline, they can't absorb fertilizer. They can't absorb nutrients. It just kind of shuts things down. So um, every plant wants to be on the acidic side. So uh, in, in the East Coast, they tend to be overly acidic, and so they have to create products that counter the acidity. Here, we have the exact opposite problem. We're too alkaline. Our water is alkaline. Every time you're watering your plant, it's, you're adding alkalinity to it. You're raising the pH. The soil is alkaline, so every time you're planting the ground, it's going into something that isn't going to do that great. So the, the natives here, they have to be tolerant of alkaline soil. That doesn't mean they don't appreciate the, any acid you give them, believe me, it, they like it. But they tolerate alkaline soil. So this is perfect. This has the perfect pH. This is what plants want. Perfect. Um, the fertilizer, we make it acidic to help counter the alkalinity in the soil and the water. So you'll, you'll want to use the right products. Um, be careful about buying ones that were made specifically for East Coast. Let's see, what else? Yes? I have a couple of butterfly bushes. Mm -hmm. um, and when, when it was very hot, mm -hmm. very hot days, the leaves would well, you know, kind of water it. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden, some of the leaves started turning black. Okay. Um, any idea what that is? Mine is a dud. Yeah, it dies. So yeah, I'll tell you great. about some of the common problems with butterfly bush. It tends to be underestimated. Very tough plant. Mm -hmm. So one, give it a good deep watering. Never shallow. Um, it's very seldom that you would ever see them wilt. That would either mean that um, they're not being watered properly. It can mean overwatering. Um, it can mean underwatering. <laughs> but it's really hard to underwater a butterfly bush if it's established. So, and you said they were turning black afterward. So I'm kind of wondering if maybe it was overwatered. <laughs> so, um, yeah, be careful with that. If you're seeing yellowing leaves, black spots, powdery mildew, things like that tend to say it's, it's a bit wet here, yeah. so be careful with that. Yeah, <laughs> good, good. Yeah, um, I would say they all need water regularly when they first go in the ground. Um, again, I, I said that they, they depend on having plenty of soil around their roots to be drought tolerant. So when you first put it in, it's been um, confined to this pot, so it really doesn't have a lot of soil. Um, so when you first put them in the, in, the, in the ground, you want to keep an eye on it. Once they start rooting out into the outer soil, now they have lots of soil that they're growing in, now they're really happy, and they're hard to kill. But don't assume that they're going to be that tough when you first put them in. Treat them like a regular plant, and then you can cut back later. The butterfly bush, I want to mention one other problem I see a lot with the butterfly bush. Um, it never gets cut back far enough. Uh, at the end of winter, you want to cut it all the way back. And everyone wants to just kind of trim it. Give it a haircut like they do their other bushes. Don't do that. Um, they'll get really, really woody and, and ugly. They really, truly do. They need to be cut all the way back down. Let them grow back. You'll find that they actually grow back to their full height every season. Every, every single time. They'll grow back so fast to you, you won't believe it. And they'll look gorgeous. But if you don't cut them back, they'll get so ugly that the same thing happens every time. It gets to the point where the homeowner says, I'm so sick of looking at this thing. And then they tear the whole thing out. The plant went to waste. And all it really needed was to be cut back. How far back? I leave like six, eight inches. Oh, I mean back. I'll okay. take that thing down. <laughs> yes. So in this real hot, hot, uh -huh. winter, how many times, how many, how much should you water how much should you water them during a real hot summer? Yes. Um, 
If it's going to be on the irrigation with everything else, I would say no more than once a week. Okay, it's not on the Yeah. If it's, if it's well established, you can even do less. Mm -hmm. That would be the, the most I'd ever give it. Less than once a week? I would never give it less than once a week. So, I'm, sorry. I, I mean, I'm sorry, I worded that wrong. I would say um, once a week or longer. I mean, depending on whether you're in the part, what part of town you are in and how dense your soil is, you could go weeks without in many cases. But if you see the leaves wilting, should you water it or leave it alone? If it seems to be wilting from dry soil, then go ahead and water. And again, older plants are going to do better. The older it is, the longer it can go without water. And we do have a lot of different areas. You know, some people, like around Thumb Butte, we do have a sandier soil. It's going to dry up faster. They're going to need more water. You might see stunted growth or wilting leaves up there if you're not watering. Um, I actually have known people with these things where they were real old plants and nobody had watered them in years. And they were still fine. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so you err, err on the dry side. Okay. What do you, what's up here that is deer resistant? Everything I plant, it seems like I'm feeding instead of growing. Um, most of what's up here is actually very deer resistant. Again, they're desperate. Um, the way a friend of mine used to put it, she said, if you were stranded out in the desert long enough, you would eat a bug. You would eat things that give you the creeps right now. That's the point where they are at. They know they can't afford to be picky. So they're eating things they don't like. So the stuff up here, I don't think there's anything here that isn't deer resistant, but if you're having that issue, and some people are, where the deer are eating things they're not supposed to, if you're having that issue, try going with things that just grow back faster. Give them some protection at first. They need to get um, a, a decent root system going. So uh, maybe put a cage over it. If you were to say plant this, plant it, put a cage over it, or something to keep them from completely demolishing it. Once it's got a good, strong root system, you take the cage off, they probably won't eat it, but if they do, it'll grow back. Uh, a lot of this will grow back. So um, the yarrow, uh, the herbs, it takes desperation to eat herbs. For animals, I'm serious. Uh, the sage, this is a, in the sage family. So it is herby. They just, they don't like anything with a pungent taste and smell. They tend to leave it alone. In fact, if you take this stuff and put it near other plants, especially if it's really pungent, um, if you put it near other plants that need a little protection, the smell, in most cases, is enough to ward off the animal, and they'll, they'll leave the more sensitive plant alone. But right now, these plants, for the most part, are still resistant. The animals still aren't eating them, for the most part. But every now and then, someone comes in and says, they ate this, or they ate that, and it's not normal. Well, hibiscus must be like a candy bar. Depends on the hibiscus. <laughs> if it's a tropical hibiscus, yes, that's a candy bar. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would recommend going with the Rose of Sharon instead. <laughs> it's hardy anyway. It'll go through the summer. Maybe a but uh, uh, yeah, be more careful. Things that um, tend to have uh, more of a smell to it, things that are fragrant or pungent, herby, uh, things that have uh, more textured leaves, um, they're always going to go for the juicier stuff. So things that um, look like they belong in the desert, mm -hmm. hairy, textured, tough looking. Um, also evergreens, they don't have a good flavor. Um, usually fruit trees, I've had people come in and say that yes, they've been nibbling at the fruit trees. But normally fruit trees have at least some protection. They're actually kind of toxic. I think what the deer are doing is saying, okay, I'm going to nibble at it just a little bit so that it, I don't get really poisoned. <laughs> and just do it a little at a time because they they want something they want moisture so bad and they're after the sap and, and moisture in the, in the plants so yes they are eating things that they don't normally eat yeah prickly yeah uh, crepe myrtle that red thing this is crepe myrtle it's not evergreen this will this will leaf out in may usually so don't assume it's dead. This is one of those that's so late to leaf out that a lot of people think, 
man, everything else is greening up and this thing still looks like sticks. It must be dead. It didn't survive the winter. And then they'll go and tear it out and throw it away. So I'm just warning you now, it, it, it will not be out any earlier than May, sometimes even late May. I think this year it was pretty late. It was almost June um, when the crepe myrtles finally started to show just a tiny bit of, of life. So it'll be late, but then it's going to bloom in July and make up for it in spades. These things are gorgeous, and the bigger they get, the more flowers they have on. They're just amazing. They come in reds, purples, pinks, whites. Are these the tree variety then? Um, or, this or one I bush? think is. Um, they come in different sizes. Mm. Um, everything from tree size mm. to small bush. I should say that the crepe myrtles here just never reach their full size like they do in other areas. Mm. They just don't. So you won't see crepe myrtle trees around here. You'll oh, see okay. bushes. Okay. But don't try to grow a tree out of okay. that. It just doesn't happen here. Okay. Uh, yeah, they seem to be doing really great with animals. I've seen some old ones that I've, I've never heard of someone complaining about these with the animals. They do real, real great. Yes? So I'm in Crescent Valley. I'm in town. I have a fenced in yard. Okay. In a small yard. And just a, a few questions with this that are probably simple answers. I have a real challenge with pollinators. Okay. Okay. Um, so I've been. This year, started new, used all the water stuff as far as soil and okay. mulch and such, such like that. Um, pretty much following your watering directions, you know, um, the, uh, the, the flower pro. Yep. Yeah, I'm doing all that. But um, I've only seen one or two yellow butterflies. Okay. okay. And they just basically come into the garden, they don't even land, they just kind of filter on through. And then, in addition to that, a lot of black flies. Mm. Okay. So I was curious if the black flies are pollinating at all, or are they just annoyances? Uh, yeah, they'll pollinate a little bit. All right, but I really want the butterflies to be. Okay. So my first question is, he, he lives in Preston Valley. It's really hot over there. Not seeing as many pollinators as he would like. My first question is, what? Uh, times of day are you uh, tend to be looking? Um, I'll actually, I've actually studied this like three or four times. Okay. Um, I, when I do water, it's usually around four or five o'clock. In the evening? Okay. In the evening. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll get up in the morning around seven, let the dog out in the backyard. Okay. Um, there's nothing on there. Okay. Midday. I'll start to see the black flies. Okay. Um, evening when the, sun, the say I say when the sun is starting to set, like a, a five six when the winds are picking up, that's when I'll see the butterflies. At one or two, just kind of filtered through the you know, but continue on their path. And uh, that's and in the evening I've actually gone out to look for critters that were eating my my leaves to, okay. to find out what was out there. Okay, so I would recommend two things in your case. Are, do you have a fertilizing schedule? Um, I fertilized actually yesterday, an hour before the storm. Okay, beautiful. With, with 744. And I've been using the, uh, the flower pro, is that what it is? Flower power? Flower power. I've been using the flower power um, every two weeks. Okay, what I'm gonna recommend to you is use this one. Right. Okay, the flower power, really punches up the blooming. Right. It really does. Um, this one has more micronutrients in it. It's far more nutritious. Uh, think of this as a good, balanced meal. Think of the flower power as a Red Bull. Right. With a shot of espresso. I've seen that. I've seen that. <laughs> yeah. That's so, amazing. yeah, it, 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 it does. It, it's something that it's, it's really going to give it a punch. But um, maybe if we try going for nutrition, see if we can really, I mean, that, that makes the food, the nectar, more nutritious, more flavorful, sweeter. Uh, if, let's try uh, the best quality fertilizer. You can still use the flower power as a supplement if you'd like. 
I find with this, you don't need a whole lot of supplementing because it's it's got everything you need. It, it does have phosphorus for blooming, and you use it on a regular basis. But if you want to supplement supplement with the flower power, you absolutely can. So with that, you're saying use it on a regular basis. So it's going to use it maybe two or three times a year. Yeah. So I yeah. got it down yesterday. Yeah. Should I... And then also in Prescott Valley, yeah. you guys are hot. Yeah. Even in the morning and yeah. evening, you guys yeah, are hot. It's 90s when I wake up. Yeah, it's 90s when you wake up, and I mean, it's already that hot. Like I was saying before, pollinators, they, especially bees, they come out when it's cooler, and as soon as it heats up, they're gone. They're looking for a shady area or some, some work to do in the hive or something. But they're going to be out of your yard at that point. Okay. So what I would recommend in your case is plant a shade tree, put up a pagoda, do something to, to cool down that area. Okay. It'll be better for them and for you. You may as well so enjoy it yourself. Should I use the 744 more often? I would use this at least four times a year. Okay. And um, and then also get some shade in, because I think what's happening is maybe they are coming to your flowers and they're gone by the time you get up. Even It's not that you're a late riser, it's just Prescott Valley's hot. Okay. And I mean, it's it gets hot in the summer. What will the monarchs work their way up here? Uh, when will the monarchs work their way through? It's it they actually appear throughout the year here. I mean, it just depends on what part of the migration they're in. And so, um, what you can do is talk to Patty and ask her at what points is she seeing the highest peaks, because she can definitely tell you those things. Last year, she had them all through the summer, and they went really, really late. Um, she was getting monarchs. She was actually getting worried. They were hatching out of the chrysalis September, November, you know, oh. through that period. And she was like, if they don't hatch out early enough, it'll be too cold for them to be able to fly away and get out of here. So she was actually getting really worried about some of them because they were going so late in the year for some reason. So uh, there's not necessarily a specific time of year. There's, a, there's just so many millions of, of butterflies out there, and they're all in different stages. It's not that all of them are in mass in one place. Right. They're, 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 so they're all in different parts of the, the migration. Yeah. I have heard, though, that... Yeah. I'm not probably going to get this one. Yeah. That the Earth has shifted in its rotation a little bit, which has affected the migration of the birds and the butterflies. Okay. Slightly off. It's not, a, their migration path is um, so wide, it's not really gonna make a, a difference. Uh, for example, they do cover most of North America, uh, like the, the United States anyway, not, not, not North America, but the United States. They, they do cover that. They do tend to be more concentrated in the Midwest and Southwest, so it's just not really gonna affect them a whole lot. I mean, they can only move over so much before they go off the coast. So um, she was wondering if the if their migration patterns have been changed by what the Earth is doing. They can only change so much. So. Uh, all right. Any other questions? On your um, butterfly bush, do you cut off the deadhead? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it will bloom more if you deadhead. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's something that some people are like. I need to keep it as as low maintenance as possible and I just don't have time to deadhead all the time and if, if that's what happens then oh well but you will get more blooms if you deadhead and uh, now some people like to leave stuff like this um, they like to leave the, the flowers on um, or maybe the, the autumn sage uh, where did I put that here we go simply because they want to go to seed and feed the songbirds some people are, are also planting for the birds. Um, so some people will do that for the birds, but otherwise I would definitely recommend deadheading if, when, as much as possible. Okay. Yes? Um, I'm a master gardener in Copeland mm -hmm. County. And I was just wondering if there were any Yavapai master gardeners here. Any Yavapai master gardeners? Oh, there's one. Okay. I just want to know what the meetings are and that sort of thing. Yeah, he can tell you. And we actually have uh, employees that are master gardeners too, so they can also tell you this stuff like that. Um, there's a tall guy named Paul walking around here somewhere. 
he can tell you. <laughs> as well. Yes. A question about the deadheading process. Do you mm -hmm. just pull the dead flowers off, or I've seen some people cut down into the plant. How do you know what you're supposed to do for which plant? This one doesn't really need as much deadheading. Okay. Not until like the end of the season, and What's it's just like kind of sitting there looking ugly after the blooming season is over. So you can, with this one, I would just say give it a haircut. Um, but what about flowers? Like when they bloom and say they'll start dying off, is what's the is there a proper way? Do you cut down into where the leaves are? Do you just pull the top of the flower? Yeah, off just uh, go down to the next uh, leaf. Okay. If it's a really tiny leaf, maybe go to the leaf to after the that. Leaf? Yeah. Okay. But yeah, you don't have to take off the whole stem. Just go ahead and, and take it down to a leaf. Okay. Um, or maybe a couple of leaves. Okay. Um, with some. Let's see. Yeah, with some of the things like this, like uh, you see how these have long stems, so you would take off this whole stem. Grab this. Like in this case, um, you would take off this whole stem all the way down to the crook down here. Okay. What plant uh, is that one? Let's see, this is, oh, this is the buckwheat. Buckwheat? Yeah. Oh. That's not, not something we have all the time. Mm -hmm. This is yarrow. In this case, I wouldn't go down to these spindly little leaves. I would go down a little bit further. To look like a clump of leaves? Yeah. Okay. Um, basically, when you're done, it should look kind of like nice and full. It shouldn't okay. look leggy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. I think we'll go ahead and uh, stop there. We're going to stop rolling, but if any of you want to ask questions afterward, um, go ahead and come and ask me. There's also other salespeople that can help you ask mm -hmm. questions. Uh, answer questions, whatever you need. All right? Thank you.